Well, welcome to the Park City Market Talk webinar, where you get the latest news about what's happening in the Park City real estate market. I'm Ron Wilstein, a broker here at Keller Williams Real Estate in Park City. And I'm Jeremy Wilstein, the buyer consultant for the Wilstein team, and we're here to share with you what's been happening in the world of Park City real estate. We're broadcasting this evening from our new offices near the Canyons Resort. We're just off of Highway 224, the main road coming into Park City. We recently changed our brokerages and we're happy to announce our new affiliation with Keller Williams Yee! Park City Real Estate. Okay. And as always, we're continuing to bring these presentations to you each and every month on the second Tuesday of the month at 7 p.m. Mountain Time. Uh, those of you who are online with us, we welcome you. Those who will be watching this later, we're glad that you are tuning in after the fact. Um, we do this webinar each month in order to be your source for current information about Park City Real Estate. And we pre present these webinars to keep you informed of changes that are always occurring and also to answer any questions that you may have. So if we don't happen to address uh, the topic as fully as you would like in this evening's presentation, at the end of our session there will be a chance that you can ask questions. In fact, the box right under the main screen says Q&A. Question comes to mind, just type it in and we'll come back to it at the end of our session together. Well, let's get started with uh, this evening's events, and let's take a look at our topics. Yes, yeah, so we're going to begin tonight's presentation by updating you on what's been happening in the Park City real estate market uh, over the past 12 months. And then we're going to share with you some details about Park City's resorts openings for the upcoming 2012-2013 ski and snowboard season. Got to, got to get the boards out. And uh, as a ski and snowboard uh, season quickly approaches, we want to share with you how you can get some incredible bargains on some brand new ski and snowboard equipment for this upcoming season. We'll also share with you a tip or two of how you can uh, winterize your home now as the cooler temperatures are arriving in Park City. We don't want any pipes going out on you, so uh, a couple of tips for that may help you out. Mm -hmm. And then we want to share with you which properties are selling first and often, um, you know, first these days and why they're selling that way. And then finally, we're going to conclude by sharing some important secrets about listing your property at the right price to sell in today's market. So we've got a lot on our schedule this evening. We're glad you're here and uh, buckle up and here we go. Yeah, and, now, and as always, before we get into this evening topics, we want to um, remind you, you can always go back and watch past Park City Market Talk webinars. We've covered a variety of topics, frequently asked questions. Simply go to ronwilstein.com forward slash webinars and you can see the selection of uh, past topics that we've covered. They're available to you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So without further delay, let's get into this evening's topics. All right. So we're going to take a look at what's been selling over the past 12 months. And the information that we're going to share with you uh, covers closed sales over the past 12 months from October 1st, 2011 through September 30th, 2012. And then we're going to compare the sales activity to the same time period the year before. So the total number of homes, condominiums, and vacant land sold during the past 12 months is up 5%, or 51 sales, from the total number of sales during the same time period the year before. And when you break that down by homes, condos, and lots, we see that we've got 494 homes sold during the past 12 months compared to 456 sales the year before. So we got 38 more sales, that's an increase of 8% for homes. Condominium sales have also risen by 7%. We've had 501 sales this past year compared to 469 the year before, that's up 32 sales. And lot sales, however, are down by 19 sales, down from 167 sales to 148. Uh, that's a decrease of about 11%. So, we're up in the home and condo category, not up in the lot sales, unfortunately. And uh, now we'll take a closer look at what did sell. Um, the number of home sales within the Park City City limits is up 9% from the year before. There were 165 sales during the past 12 months compared to 151 the year before. Sales are also up at the Snyderville Basin with 329 sales during the past year compared to 305 the year before. So that's an increase in 24 sales or 8%. And then as we turn to condominiums, condominium sales rose by 5% within the Park City limits to 281 closed sales within the past year compared to 268 
the year before, increase of 5%. Snyderville Basin also saw the buying activity increase with 19 more sales, which equates to a 9% increase from 201 sales the previous year to 220 during the past 12 months. So it's nice to report here, you know, we've been doing this for four years and each month we report it's either going up, it's either going down. It's nice to report consistently yeah. it is going up. Yes, it is. And uh, take a look at vacant land sales. They were mixed with them rising within the Park City limits and falling in the Snyderville Basin. Within the Park City limits, the number of lot sales rose by 10 sales with 35 sales this past year compared to only 25 the year before, so that's up 40%. Lot sales, however, found the Snyderville Basin with 29 fewer sales during the past 12 months compared to the year before. So this past year, we saw 113 sales in Snyderville Basin compared to 142 sales the year before. Uh, so this amounts to a 20% decline year over year. And you know, as you know, if you've been on our webinars last year, there was you know 50 about 50% of our sales were land and promontory that is now not available or the low end of the market has been all bought now. That's right. It's really been absorbed there in the promontory marketplace. The very best deals are still good deals there, but I'd say the very best deals are gone. Yeah. It's a marketplace. Yeah. It's a real estate. Getting a five hundred thousand dollar lot for eighty thousand. Those days are gone. <laughs> oh well. Oh well. So all in all we're continuing to see the number of sales increasing each month and uh, we do these webinars every single month so that we can see the changes and uh, it's, it's significant and the nice thing is it's good news. Mm -hmm. Let's go through those. All right. So uh, our next topic, we're going to just uh, touch on uh, winter sports here in Park City, especially skiing and snowboarding. Yep. Um, the temperatures are certainly dropping here in Park City and the resorts, you know, they'll be opening well, we'll find out. <laughs> They'll be opening soon. So that means it's time to schedule your vacations. That's and, right. uh, you know, we'll take a look. We'll give you the uh, uh, scheduled opening dates for other resorts. Obviously, it's weather dependent. That's right. Uh, but on your screen, that we've got the schedule from the resort, resorts published today. This is what they're aiming for. With uh, Park City Mountain Resort being the first one to open on Saturday, November 17th. <clears throat> this is followed by the Canyons opening on Friday. November 23rd, that's the day after Thanksgiving, so if you have a nice big meal, you can uh, shake it off on the slopes if there's enough snow. And then finally, Deer Valley is scheduled to open on Saturday, December 8th, 2012. So get out your equipment, tune it up, and uh, we hope to see you on the slopes. And a great segue, if you need some new equipment. That's right. We want to mention that the 40th Annual Park City Ski and Snowboard Swap will take place on Friday, November 2nd through sat, uh, Sunday, November 4th at the Basin Recreation Fieldhouse at Kimball Junction. Um, this is one of the oldest swaps in the country and one of the largest. Ski Magazine says it's one of the best ski swaps in the country. I know I got a lot of stuff from there last year. Um, and for those of you who have not attended the event, you know, there's a huge selection. There's new and new skis and snowboards, boots, poles, clothing, helmets, accessories, all under one roof and they got good prices on everything. So definitely go check it out. And you know, if you do have equipment that you want to sell, you can check in that equipment between October 29th and November 2nd prior to the event. Just go to parkcityskiswap.com for further details on it. And uh, you can uh, maybe share some of your experiences on your equipment with other people as well. Uh, the swap begins Friday evening at 8 p.m., continues until 1 a.m. in the morning. Admission Friday night is ten dollars per person. Kids under twelve are free. Uh, doors open on Saturday at ten a.m. and they continue to stay open till six p.m. The admission drops down to uh, five dollars on Saturday and Sunday. The swap is open from ten a.m. to two p.m. and admission is two dollars on that final day. Kids, of course, under twelve are free. And it's important to mention that 30% of the sales commission benefits the Park City Ski Team. Uh, so a good portion of sales goes to a good cause. I was one of them one time. Okay. So, you know, mark your calendars and plan to attend. It's a fun event to see everybody in Park City. Yep. So <clears throat> let's talk about winterizing your property. Uh, the weather is definitely getting colder. It's time to think about winterizing your home. There are many <clears throat> ways that you can do this. And by taking property 
care of your home, you will literally save yourself thousands of dollars in repairs and sometimes in energy expense as well. Uh, we're going to mention the most obvious things here, and they are clearly the most important ones as well. But I do want to point out to you that just to the uh, right of our main screen or just under our picture, we've included uh, a file of 50 ways to winterize your home. And feel free to print that out, and I hope that is helpful. Whether you're in Park City or elsewhere across the country, you may find it beneficial. It's not specific to Park City, but of course, we got cold weather, we need to do this. So what are the most important uh, items here when it comes to winterizing your, fall, your uh, property? First of all, you want to deal with your sprinkler systems. Have a professional come and blow them out. This is the right time to do it. Uh, we're getting overnight freezing temperatures, and so um, you don't need to water your lawn anymore. Uh, it's pretty much done. <coughs> Excuse me. Also set your heat at 60 degrees or higher, especially if you're away from your home. Uh, in case we get the deep freeze. Now, if and when the outdoor temperatures do drop to zero, which is not going to happen this month, but it will happen later in the season, usually at one point in time or another, if your property is not in a rental program or if it's vacant, be sure to open up any cabinet doors when there's plumbing that are enclosed behind it. Uh, this allows heat from the home to warm the pipes rather than allowing severe outdoor temperatures to reduce the temperature in those closed cabinets that may be on exterior walls. You definitely won't, don't want your plumbing to, uh, to freeze. Uh, another good tip is insulate your hot water lines around your water heater. And uh, often they are in a mechanical room accompanied with a uh, furnace. The furnace sometimes keeps the room uh, warm so you don't need it, but there's combustion air that has to come in for the furnace and that brings sometimes cold air into a, that sort of room. So insulate your water heater pipes maybe wrap it with a blanket or fiberglass insulation. Uh, and I would say the fifth item is install or replace weather stripping around your doorways or on your garage doors. I have to do that in mine um, just so that that gap is filled and you, you just don't have that uh, cold weather coming in here. So uh, hopefully you'll find those tips beneficial if you live in areas that require that sort of uh, condition and treatment. Um, this screen here is just kind of a from last month, um, we actually recorded a webinar with uh, Ed Knapp, who's uh, a colleague with Jeremy. He's one of our buyer consultants. And if you go to our webinars, it is on how to use your self-directed IRA to purchase real estate. And we're not going to deal with the topic here, but Ed and I deal with it at length. And, and check it out. It's, it's, a lot of people don't realize that you can um, purchase real estate in a self-directed IRA or even provide financing. Uh, and you might get a better return by doing financing in a self-directed IRA rather than putting it in your bank. In fact, I know you'll get a better return if it's something that you'd be comfortable with. So uh, check that out if, you, if you'd like, and uh, it's well worth your time taking a look at that. Uh, so let's move on to the next topic, and uh, we want to turn our attention to three important elements that we've come to see time and time again in the marketplace, which clearly identifies which properties repeatedly sell year in year out in Park City. And these three factors will seem obvious once we mention them to you, but we wanted to emphasize them to you here in our webinar because many property owners think their properties have these elements already, and frankly, they often don't. Uh, and it often takes the honest and sometimes painful advice from a real estate professional, a broker, uh, to share with them honestly how their property is perceived by the marketplace of buyers. So we want to share with you now these three important and impactful elements that will affect the sale of your property and they also affect the purchase of properties if you're an investor. Mm -hmm. uh, so the first characteristic or quality is the prop in the property is obviously location. Location, location, location. I'm sure you've heard the age old saying that you know three most sell important elements are location, location, location. Um, the location of the property has always been the number one most consistent element in determining the value of real estate. Mm -hmm. The same exact property, whether it's a home, it's a condo, it's a vacant land, in one location has one value, and in another location it has, it has a totally different value. Uh, a couple years ago, I sold a beautiful home at the top of Pinebrook. In fact, one of the nicest ones I've seen in Park City over the years. It really was extraordinary, and that home was listed for. 1,795,000. Now, 
Now, this price was higher than any other property had ever sold for in that area, but it was truly an exceptional home. And nobody ever commented that that home wasn't fantastic and that the value of it, uh, was there from the asking price uh, in the home. However, it was the highest priced property in the area and as such it encountered serious price resistance from buyers. That exact home could have sold over and over and over again for twice the price in Upper Deer Valley and it would have been perceived as a bargain in that location, but it wasn't. It was located in a different area, a good area, but a different area and as such it had a different value. Location plays a powerful role in setting the price of real estate. So what does this mean? It means simply that the location of a property needs to be considered when pricing it. A great house in a good location is great, but that same house in a great location will be valued much differently and the better the location, the higher the price. Both buyers and sellers need to look critically at the location of any home that they're considering or condominium or even vacant land before they assign a value. This is as true for a buyer looking at a property comparing it to others in different locations mm -hmm. as it is a seller. Mm -hmm. uh, next is the element of demand. So how much demand is there for this sort of property in the current marketplace? You know, there are a lot of buyers out there looking for this sort of property in today's market or very few. Uh, you can have a great property in an excellent location, but if nobody's looking for that sort of property right now, you may not be able to sell it. And that is no reflection um, on the property as, as it being good or bad. It's simply a case that there's not a strong demand or desire for the property in the current marketplace. And therefore it's difficult to sell. Or the property must be discounted substantially to attract buyers to consider it. You know, this is one of the most difficult realities for a home buyer or homeowner to grasp when they're trying to sell their property. They can justify the price assigned to the property from the past sales and other factors but when there is an absence of interest buyers for the property in the current market, you simply just cannot sell it. That's right. So there's location, there's demand. The third element that we want you to reflect on is condition. And the condition of a property has a significant impact on buyers as they look at it and compare one property to another. Of these three elements, this final one is the only one that the property owner has any control over. A property owner cannot control the location of their home or their condominium, nor can they lift it up and move it to one location that they prefer over where they might presently be at. The improved property is fixed to the land and that land isn't going anywhere. Nor can they alter the level of demand in the marketplace for that type of property that might match your property and your price range. You're simply at the mercy of the current demand in the marketplace. However, when it comes to the condition of your property, you certainly can bring the property up one or two levels if you want to. Yeah, so a property in excellent condition shows a buyer that the owner has taken pride and care in his, his or her property. The owner properly maintained it and always fixed things when they're broken and made sure that every item was in proper working order. You know, I, I walk through many houses with buyers and you can tell when a seller is really organized and, you know, has everything in the right place. You just know over the last five or ten years of how long they've owned it that they've really taken good care of it and it goes a long way, especially in showing it. Um, and you know, I've found that most uh, owners feel their property is in pretty good shape. Often they're right, but many times they're not. Um, a seller can ignore the feedback or input that he or she receives from the real estate agent or broker, but they, they can't ignore what buyers are saying about, the, about them, um, about their property. So, you know, sellers really rarely hear an honest uh, critique from a buyer as to what the buyer didn't like about the property. But it, but it is for this reason, it is imperative that an agent clearly conveys to an owner critical comments about the condition of the property, even though it's not what the seller wants to hear oftentimes. Now, sometimes agents are reluctant to tell sellers what they need to hear as to the condition of their property because they don't want to offend the seller, but they need to know the truth and who they're going to hear it from if not their agent. Buyers figure this, this stuff out all by themselves. They simply look at the property, either online or in person, and if they get that far into this, in their search for a property and they cast their vote on each property by their actions or lack thereof. 
They either put in an offer on the property or they eliminate it from their consideration and move on to the next property. In either case, the property does not sell and often the seller does not know exactly what's happening and why. So it's imperative for a broker or a sales agent to be very honest with a property owner who's looking to sell his or her property. Uh, if they don't hear critical input from that broker, they cannot do anything to correct their problem that they may not even be aware of. Consequently, the property does not sell because the agent wasn't forthright and honest with the seller. I actually spoke with a, a seller this week, uh, two days ago. They called me and they, they had been listed for uh, just over a year with this particular agent and the agent told them something that they hadn't heard for a whole year. They kind of called me a little frustrated and said, this feels like it came out of the blue. Why didn't they tell me this before? And of course, I didn't know why they didn't tell them it. But it's an example that actually sellers, even though it may not have been what they wanted to hear, they do want to hear it because it helps them make a good decision and uh, a well-informed decision. So if you're a seller and you want an honest, helpful feedback, you need not to be defensive if you have a tendency to be that way if your agent tells you the truth about the condition of the property. Agents often do not tell their clients what they need to hear uh, because they don't want to be attacked uh, about their opinion. So if you're a seller who wants to really sell your property, ask your agent to comment honestly about the condition of the property. Ask for suggestions as to how you can improve it so that it can sell faster and for more money. You know, when you go to the doctor, they examine you and they tell you bad news. <laughs> you don't yell at the doctor and say, why'd you tell me this? I don't agree. Um, you know, you go in there for the expertise. So uh, do the same with your real estate broker. You'll get some valuable input that will make the difference. Now, if you do this, your agent tells you the truth about your property. You listen to them, but he or she recommends you carry out his or her recommendations. You're likely to be the beneficiary of the improvement to your property. You're likely to sell it faster. You're likely to sell it for more money than if you hadn't taken their advice. So all in all, it's a good idea. <clears throat> so let's move to our next and final topic uh, this evening, which I'm calling the secrets of listing your property at the right price. And I've got a couple extra slides in here I need to move out. Um, in any event, in reality, there's no secrets when it comes to properly pricing your property. However, there are some key factors that once understood uh, will give a seller the information that he or she needs to make the correct decision when it comes to pricing their property to sell in today's market. There are two things that we want to talk about now. The first one is we want to talk about the um, list of sold ratio in the marketplace. And the second one is what I call the 10% rule. Now in today's market, the properties that do sell are selling for between 94 to 96% of their list price. That is to say, that sellers during negotiations are coming off their list price between four to six percent. Now, this tells you a couple of important things. Number one, buyers, as a general rule, expect sellers to come off their list price during negotiations, because in fact, they are. Secondly, at a minimum, they expect a seller will be willing to reduce their price by four to six percent by the time they're done negotiating with the buyer. Now, this is a reasonable expectation, and a seller should expect and plan accordingly. Yeah, and then the next fact, which we call the 10% rule, is important in light of how sellers try to work the numbers when it comes to list price and the desired sales price. So the 10% rule says sellers can list their property no higher than 10% above the fair market price for their property and expect that their property will sell in today's market. However, if they list it higher than 10%, they will not likely sell their property. In fact, they will be hard pressed to get anyone interested in it enough to uh, even make an offer on the property. 94% of all buyers go to the internet first to search for properties and from the internet they can gain a pretty good idea of what the fair market value of a property should be. If a property is listed for more than 10% above the property's fair market value they are likely to consider it if the other features in the property match their criteria including location and condition as we discussed earlier. However, if the property is listed higher than 10% above its fair market value, the property is almost doomed from the day it's placed on the market to not sell. Today's buyers are so well informed about the market and property values, they simply don't waste any time on overpriced listings. So many sellers, once they understand this 4 to 6% list to sold ratio, 
try to outsmart the market or overprice and overprice your property above and beyond that 10% top end cap that we just presented to you in this webinar. And what they do is they, they think to themselves, okay, if I have to come off four to six percent, I want to list it higher so that once I come off four to six percent or sell it for 46, 96 or 94 percent off the list price, I end up with the higher price that I'm after. And while, the, while this rationale is sound, it, it frankly doesn't work that way. Buyers purchase a property for 94 to 96 percent of the list price. And our market data clearly shows this. And if you list a property more than 10% of the fair market, it's not a case that they simply come off the 4 to 6%. In reality, in today's marketplace, to the contrary, what they turn up doing is they simply pass on the property. There's enough properties on the market, and there's plenty that are overpriced. So that the ones that are priced correctly, they see they gravitate toward, they're willing to work with a price that's 10% above, but it's something like, some sort of powerful resistance that stalls out those um, buyers so that uh, they simply won't look at those properties. Now, I do want to take a moment just to talk about what happens if you ignore what I just said. In other words, I still want to list it higher than 10%, maybe 15%, maybe 20%. And I don't have a visual to demonstrate right now because I can tell we have a little bit of a slide problem here. But let me explain it to you. If you price too high, what happens is the property stays on the market for an extended period of time without anybody looking seriously at it. What happens is as months roll by, the property becomes stale. When the property becomes stale, then buyers start asking, what's wrong with the property? Why isn't it selling? There must be something wrong. And so the seller eventually has to lower the price and he or she may lower the price to get to a point where it's still above the fair market value, maybe, you know, by the 10% now or the 8%. But because of the length of time, because of the reluctance and the caution on buyers wondering why the property has been on the market so long, it doesn't sell. And so the seller has to do another price reduction to fair market value, but in a declining market, uh, which we were in for a couple of years, now we're starting to stabilize, you know, they couldn't accelerate their declining list price is fast enough to catch those buyers. Now it's pretty much stabilized, it's trying to work its way up, but what we found is over time that if you start to buy, you not only postpone your ability to sell your property in a reasonable period of time, but you actually turn up selling it for less because buyers just pound away at sellers who have been on the market a long time. So keep that in mind. Um, the list to sold ratio is very important to know it. 4 to 6 percent off the list price of a properly priced property. Don't overlist it above 10 percent. And if you're highly motivated to sell, you want to sell it quicker, then of course get closer to that fair market price. Well, um, that brings us to the end of our presentation. We want to give you a chance to ask any questions that may come to mind. Let me just skip ahead to some slides here. Uh, there it is. Um, We've got some questions on the screen that we're going to take here in a second, but if you haven't written them, by all means, take this time now to do it, and we'll simply remind you that you can watch past webinars by going to ronwillstein.com forward slash webinars. Um, so that information is available. Think of selling your property. Uh, request a Smart Seller Magazine. It tells you how we list properties and uh, help sellers accomplish their goals. So let's, uh, let's take a look at these questions. And we want to read the question here. So I've noticed that lots in Summit Park are quite depressed compared to a few years ago. Do you think it would be a good investment to purchase a lot in Summit Park as an investment? Um, you know, I think it just depends on where the lot is located. There are a lot of lots. There's probably close to 30 lots on the market right now for sale in Summit Park. Um, there's a good handful of them that are priced properly. And if you go there and find those lots and that meets your needs for what you're looking for, either to build or simply as an investment, I would grab it. Um, there are some overpriced properties that I would caution you to uh, consider carefully if you're an investor. But what you may find is you may find some um, folks out there who own properties. And this isn't 
just some of this is other areas as well, that um, the law market has been so soft and declining as we reported in the Snyderville Basin, they may be ready to uh, to uh, sell their property and, and sell them at a discount. So uh, if you can buy it right and you've got holding time, uh, meaning that don't buy a lot in Summit Park expecting that in a year or two it's going to turn around and uh, you're going to make a killing on it. I think you really need to think about a four or five time, year time frame uh, to be cautious and not disappointed by your, your objectives. <clears throat> All right. Any other questions, Ray? Okay, I think. Is that it? Yeah. So I'm not sure. All right. Well, uh, thank you for joining us for this evening's webinar. And we apologize for some of the slides, uh, getting some bonus slides in there that we weren't planning for. But uh, we're glad that you've joined us. Our next webinar will be. Um, held on November 13th at 7 p.m. And uh, don't forget about that webinar on the self-directed IRAs. That's posted on our website right now, so you can check it out. Mm -hmm. And as always, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact us anytime at 800-535-0151. Right. So from all of us here in Park City, have a good evening. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.